Hi, welcome to Ethereum Mechanics video number 21. This is the third Ether video, and it's the second video on the new Ether model. This is the most important 15 minutes in the history of science. Okay. Sorry, Terrence and Philip are back. <laughs> um, okay, there's been something that has bothered me since uh, high school physics when I took it when I was young. And we're going to cut to that demonstration now. When I was in high school, my physics teacher did a demonstration about potential energy. He held up his briefcase and he walked around the front of the class. He kept the height of the briefcase the same and he said because the height of the briefcase isn't changing that the potential energy of the briefcase is remaining constant. Okay, there's something that's been bothering me ever since that day and like Columbo, these little details bother me. And the little detail I had, and I'm going to demonstrate now with the cannonball problem that I had. Here's our magic almighty brass cannonball. I'm holding this brass cannonball out at a certain height above the ground. As long as I keep the height of the cannonball the same, the potential energy of this cannonball given by mass times acceleration gravity times height remains constant. Okay, but here's where I have the problem. I'm burning chemical energy in the form of calories to maintain this cannonball at that height. Okay, if my bodily functions stop right now, this cannonball is falling to the ground. It's going to assume a lower energy state. Okay, all right. Well, all right. let's go on. Let's go. Suppose I had an RC helicopter. A little RC helicopter just hovering right here. That helicopter is going to burn a certain amount of fuel at a certain rate to maintain its height. But under the load of the cannonball, that RC helicopter has got to burn fuel at an increased rate to maintain the energy state of this cannonball. All right, well now I pick up a magic post. Same height above the ground. I call on the gods of conservation of energy. Okay, if this ball is being maintained at the same height, this stick has to be burning more energy than it would if the cannonball were not there. Something's got to be burning energy here too. Something's got to be consuming energy because this stick is now under stress that it wasn't under before. And so it's got to be burning energy at a higher rate. Well. The stick isn't losing mass because E equals mc squared means mass can be converted to energy, but this stick is not losing mass to maintain the height of that cannonball. So energy must be coming from somewhere. Okay, and even the stick by itself, well, the upper part of the stick has to be held up by the lower part. That means the lower part's got to burn energy to hold up the upper part of the stick, even without the cannonball. That means matter must be consuming energy to maintain its states, its higher energy states. Okay, so there's got to be some sort of fuel that's being consumed by matter so matter can exist. That ends this part of the demonstration. Okay, returning from that demonstration. With the cannonball demonstration, it was shown that energy must be consumed to maintain the potential energy of the cannonball. Okay, uh, energy must be consumed to maintain stored energy. Okay, so Einstein's E equals mc squared shows that all matter is energy in a stored state. Thus, matter must consume energy to maintain that state. Okay, matter is no longer a perpetual motion machine like all the other physics have it. Matter has to consume energy to, to, be, to maintain its form. Since mass is stable, in other words, in other words uh, mass is not consuming energy its mass to maintain its energy. It's not, in other words, it's not consuming its own energy to maintain its energy, otherwise it would be losing mass. And since the mass is stable, energy must be supplied externally. And since in the last video we theorized that matter must consume space, which we, is really the ether, then ether is a logical source of the material energy. Okay, side note one, relativity is irrelevant. He is oblivious to this external energy. Gravity is not the bending in space, it's the consumption of ether. Okay, uh, energy source of gravity. In Medio 14, we said that all emitted fields must have a source of energy, otherwise, a massive body or the object that's emitting that energy must be losing mass. Okay, so, but. Uh, so sustaining emitted field must consume energy, possibly consuming mass. So the question was, how do planets emit gravity fields without losing mass? That was the question. 
Well, the solution, since gravity is not an emission, it's a consumption of ether, the problem of the source of the energy for gravity field is resolved. Um, <clears throat> relativity is oblivious to this as well. Essentially, gravity sucks. Key points here. Matter consumes ether to exist. Higher energy states require higher consumption rate of ether. Objects under stress consume more ether. Higher energy states are heavier nuclei, coherent fields like the field emitted by a, a magnet, stored energy like if I pull on this string I have to maintain energy to keep that spring in that state and that spring since it's under stress has to be consuming more energy as well. And because a higher energy state is also one half mv squared then objects in motion have to consume ether at a higher rate as well. Okay, the solution to the Michelson-Morley experiment is ethereal drag as theorized by early physicists. However, the, ether, the ethereal drag model proposed back then is ridiculous. And we're going to go more into this in the next video. And the reason why it's ridiculous, because we learned in the last video that if an object is moving with the ether, then it's moving inertialessly. In other words, if you're not accelerating relative to the ether, if you're accelerating with the ether, you're moving inertialessly. Yes, inertialessly. And therefore, if an object is dragging the ether with it, you'd be able to move objects inertialessly. Okay, there is drag, but it is so small, so small, you would not be able to detect it. But over millions and millions and billions of years, eventually the objects in orbit around the sun convert their kinetic energy into ethereal motion, and now they're moving with the ether. We're going to show you an experiment um, in the next video that will show you, highlight that. It's a, it sounds complicated, but once you look at the experiment, you'll see it's pretty quite simple. It's a common thing we see every day. Um, now, the following uh, slides provide some aspects of ethereal mechanics which are displayed conceptually so we may continue our logical development of the ether. Um, we have a more rigid uh, coverage of the ether with mathematical and later videos. Um, I want to get the fun stuff out of the way first because the other videos that go heavy into math are really only for a very small audience. Um, radioactive decay. Dense matter is a higher energy state matter which requires higher ether densities to maintain stability. Matter which is starved of ether will decay without cause like Lorentzium does. Matter which is barely supplied with ether will not be able to maintain stability under stress like plutonium getting it's, it's a nucleus getting hit by a neutron. It doesn't, it's barely stable. But you get something like hydrogen, which can withstand a lot of stress because it doesn't require a lot of ether to maintain hydrogen in its state. So with fission, the thing we have to realize here is that density, when fission, fissile materials go from highly dense material to a more puffy material. So we convert density to volume. It's like popcorn. Okay, so, so, and the volume, so, as heavier nuclei decay into light nuclei, the required ether consumption decreases and the volume of the matter increases. So we go from heavier elements to lighter elements. The more ether consumption, the less ether consumption. From a dense, denser material to a fluffier material, more volume. This is important. Remember that. Okay, think of popcorn. This is an important concept that we're going to need when we discuss the Stinti's universe and how stars generate energy under, under my theory of the universe. An object moving at velocity relative to the ether represents a higher energy state. Ether is consumed, more ether is consumed. Actually, matter will condense. Okay, that should actually be at higher speeds. Um, oh, uh, matter can actually condense. That, that means uh, it compresses a little bit. Lighter materials at a very high speed relative to the ether, lighter materials fusion will occur. Hydrogen will fuse to helium under very high ethereal speeds. Heavier materials like plutonium and lorentzium will become more stable as the uh, velocity of uh, their velocity relative to the ether increase. Now some people say, well that's time dilation. Nah, it's not time dilation. Thus faster moving ether is a surrogate for dense ether. Faster moving ether is a surrogate for dense ether. There's going to be more on that in later videos. At the speed of light, matter collapses. Again, we're going to get into more detail on later videos. So, Distinti's universe versus the Big Bang. The Big Bang theory keeps repeating. Well, they're not sure about that. But eventually, after the Big Bang, subatomic particles 
condense into free hydrogen, which then under the, collect together and under gravity uh, combine to a super dense state. So the universe goes from a lower energy state to a higher energy state, which doesn't seem to jive with thermodynamics. And Distinti's universe, I think it's a one-shot deal. I don't have a reason why it should repeat, but I'm not sure about that. Distinti's universe, the universe started out as a super dense matter, and as the ether is depleted, it starts bubbling like popcorn and exploding in certain places, distributing matter all over the place. Um, uh, and, and so eventually, as lighter in the bellies of stars, heavier atoms are decomposed into lighter atoms. And we're going to cover uh, stellar uh, dynamics later. Uh, so the, the universe is going from super dense state, eventually it'll all end up as free hydrogen, and then eventually when the ether gets too uh, thin to support free hydrogen, free hydrogen will break down into subatomic particles. So we're going from a high energy state universe to a low energy state, and as ether diminishes, dense matter becomes unstable, gravity weakens, all fields weaken, uh, everything goes to a lower lower energy state, higher and higher entropy. This is consistent with thermodynamics. Okay, but ethereal mechanics is more than just science. Uh, it was stalled for some time until I realized there's a fundamental component of mathematics that's missing. Uh, this missing component to be revealed later will cause significant revisions of math, science, and engineering texts, presently writing a paper for submission. So we have a quintuple punch here. Ethereal mechanics is a synthesis of new electromagnetism, new ether model, new mathematical construct, more complete understanding of energy, and a new wave model. Helmholtz is obsolete. Um, so the major portion of modern science is going to be made obsolete, including all these guys here, in my opinion, of course. So I'll recap, we can no longer ignore the ether. Matter consumes ether to exist. No longer can we accept perpetual motion of current science, where electrons orbit forever without consuming energy, where energyless field emissions like gravity, Coulomb fields, how can a charge emit a field without consuming energy? How can a magnet emit a magnetic field without consuming energy? Uh, how can bodies stay in motion for energy without consuming energy? How can light propagate infinitely without loss? Okay, how can matter just exist until it decays from some random process? This is all junk science, my friends. You need to consume energy to do everything in this universe. Nothing is for free. Um, so, the roadmap ahead, we're going to cover in the next 10 videos is Distinti's universe. Um, after that, there's going to be a three-month delay in production because I have to move and reset up my studio, and, and I also have to produce a paper on, on the new math construct. Um, then we're going to do the new math construct, new electromagnetism, V5. Um, I think we're going to do an etherless application where this would be for electrical engineers where you don't have to consider the ether. don't know if that's really needed because new electromagnetism, V4, is sufficient for electrical engineering. Um, and then we're going to look at the electromagnetic properties of the ether. What is the ether? How can we define the ether in terms of electromagnetism? And then we're going to develop the new wave model. Uh, we're going to do, and then we're going to combine that with a new wave model to produce the new model for light. And guess what? This is only the halfway point of ethereal mechanics. I missed. And that's what happened to me when I started producing the videos. Uh, it helped me find the ports, points that I was stuck on because I was so advanced into it I couldn't see the little things I'd missed earlier. Um, this is what's next. Uh, thank you for contributing. Please get the word out about these videos um, and please subscribe. If you subscribe then you'll get an instant notification of um, when the new videos come out. Thank you very much.